We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning to everyone. And after yet another bombastic video from our IGF 2021 uh, organizers. We are ready to start this uh, DC3 session, this annual session of the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing Senka on the screen while I'm speaking. I'm not sure if this is something that everyone is seeing, uh, but I, <laughs> I just wanted to be sure that our technical support is following up uh, things. Now I see everyone. Now I think it was it's only on my on my side. Uh, so welcome to everyone. Welcome to this uh, sixth annual meeting of the uh, Dynamic Coalition on uh, Community Connectivity. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you and to see also the coalition expanding new faces. We are a large community of community network supporter. Uh, my name is Luca Belli. I'm a professor at FGD Law School, uh, where I had the Center for Technology and Society. I am one of the co-founders of this coalition. I have had the pleasure of being uh, with you over the past six years. And uh, today I will co-moderate this meeting with uh, my good friend Senka Hazic, that many of you already know, that has been also a great supporter and co-editor of the book that we are releasing today, uh, the book on community networks towards sustainable funding models. We will share the uh, link that has just been sent by the IGF secretariat uh, in the chat in a couple of seconds. Yes, already Senka has shared it. So you, we already have the, this, this book. Uh, you can share it uh, with the word. So uh, why a couple of words before we start uh, and we give the, the floor to our opening remarks speakers, our keynote speakers. We also have a video from Natalia Vinelli from Enacom that unfortunately was not able to, to be here with us. Uh, so the, critically, I think this topic of internet access, connectivity, meaningful connectivity has acquired finally the relevance it deserves for many years, uh, people, the usual suspects, considered it as something essential, but most of people thought this may be a, a, a problem only for the developing world. Then the, the COVID-19 arrived and we discovered that it's a problem from everyone, especially from the, for the developing world. So as the, the world now enters a, a new phase of recovery from the hardest part of the pandemic, which is not over yet, but likely, hopefully, the hardest part is already behind us. Uh, it is very interesting that to note that not only that uh, connectivity has become vital for everyone, for all our lives, professional lives, personal lives, our health, uh, but in our education, our economy, everything, basically. But also that there is still almost 40% of the population that is excluded from connectivity. And that we have also a once-in-a-lifetime chance to make things better, as, as, as someone would argue, to rebuild things. Uh, but what is already touted uh, as a fundamental right by many, connectivity, internet access, is only a privilege uh, for a, the wealthiest part of the world. And for the poorest part of the world is simply a dream, something that is not, has not arrived yet, something that the, 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 the classic strategies we have been using for the past decades, clearly fail to accomplish universally. So it's really think time to think out of the box, to consider alternative solutions to expand connectivity. Community networks are a very interesting uh, uh, solution. That's an, an alternative model that we have been uh, discussing for many years. Uh, in, in case anyone here or anyone who is watching us has not heard yeah, uh, before about community networks, because we may have newcomers, uh, those are 
crowdsourced network, collaborative networks de developed in a bottom-up fashion by groups of individuals, local communities, uh, could be also administra local administrations, local entrepreneurs, uh, the local stakeholders, let's say, that create this partnership, this connectivity partnership, and develop, manage the infrastructure as a, as a common resource. So uh, this, uh, critically also, another point that I want to stress for those who are, who are hearing about community networks for the first time, they are not competing or antagonistic models to the existing one, ones. So the ones based on, on, on private sector investments or public funding, uh, they are, community networks, they do not compete with this. They are useful complements to uh, bridge all those, those gaps, those lacunas that are left by the limits of the other uh, classic uh, strategies we have that clearly have limits as 40% of the unconnected world population can witness. So we have, we are here to discuss community networks. We have been doing this for years, but now we are adding a, a, a perspective that was pretty much unexplored or very, very uh, uh, not neglected, but with very few attention to it. Also from researchers, some research already existed, but not a lot about sustainability of community networks, about the financial sustainability of community networks, which is, which is a, a missing perspective that we are trying to uh, discuss today. What are the sustainable funding models of community networks? How can such initiatives thrive? What are the best practices that allow this uh, initiative to flourish? We have uh, organized a, a very interesting uh, volume this year. Many of the participants of this volume are here today as speakers. Uh, Senka has just shared this in the chat. We will share this uh, in on our, it's already on the uh, DC3 uh, uh, web page on the IGF website, so you can already, already find it on the IGF website. It's not very easy to find things on the IGF website, so we also have put it on the uh, DC3 website, so on comconnectivity.org. If you go there, you can already find it, uh, and we will share it on social media. We will try to make the greatest visibility to this. So without further ado, I will just uh, now, uh, give the floor to Senka to, to spend a couple of words about this uh, book, this excellent initiative that we have been organizing together, and then we will start with the opening remarks uh, by Natalia Vinet. Thanks, Luca. Uh, I think I shared the link in the chat already. But yeah, I'm just going to copy it once again. So this. Uh, official outcome of the uh, DC3 for 2021 is um, a book which has been edited by Luca and myself and has opening uh, remarks by Henriette Chesterheisen. And the volume is actually the result of a collective effort. Um, we had 25 authors contributing to 10 chapters, which are um, a combination of papers, essays, uh, case studies, uh, reflections, stories from the field. Uh, from community networks all around the world. And um, I also want to point out that most contributors are in fact uh, community networks practitioners and people who have built community networks and have actually experienced the, the, the challenges that they described in their, in their stories. Um, so the book is a compilation of very different uh, viewpoints and perspectives on funding and sustainability. And I also want to highlight that we have achieved quite some diversity when it comes to uh, contributors in terms of geography, stakeholder groups, and gender balance as well. Um, yeah, as Lucas said, some of the authors are here with us today, and they will be um, unpacking their contributions in, um, in their talks later today. Um, so yeah, please do not forget to download, read, distribute, and share the book. And yeah, just as Henriette said nicely in her, in her foreword, uh, read, learn, and be inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Sanka, for, for this. And uh, indeed, uh, we have just shared the book. And what is very interesting about this book is also that it's really a, concrete examples from people that build community networks, that study community networks, that, that advocate for community networks, also about the positive externalities that this, can, this initiative can generate. Uh, for those of you that have been reading, uh, uh, what I have been writing over the past years is about network self-determination, so self-determination of people, uh, not only building connectivity, but also building local 
digital ecosystems, local uh, trade and business initiatives, uh, access to knowledge. It's really about self-determination of people deciding what is your cultural, technological, and economic development. And uh, this is really what uh, the book, all the, all the book is about. I also wanted to add something on top of Senka, uh, what Senka was saying about gender. It's not really gender balance, it's a gender unbalance because we managed some a pretty outstanding result, which is to have almost 80% of contributors that are female. So and again, evidence that uh, there is there are a lot of very smart and strong women uh, leading uh, in this field. Uh, and many of them are in this book. And it's really a privilege to have them as not only as friends, but also as co-authors of this work. So uh, without further ado, I would really like to ask, uh, because I'm not seeing Henriette here yet. Uh, so I would like to ask to uh, Walter to share. Luca, Luca I am yeah. here. Oh, yeah, sorry. So you are, I'm not saying on the Zoom because you are in the hybrid I'm, I'm not in the Zoom because my <laughs> battery is dead and there are no okay. plugs in the room. Wonderful. Really Excellent. Sorry. It's really great to see you, Henriette. Sorry for you. I, I was not, I, I'm too, I'm too uh, formatted by Zoom. So if I don't see people on Zoom, I don't, they don't exist. So, sorry, it's the Henriette. new reality. Exactly. So please, Henriette, the floor is yours. And then but, but, after Raul, um, sorry, I'm so sorry. I have to also apologize. I notified Senka. I've been asked to stand in for uh, Koliwe Majama, my colleague who was supposed to present at the Dynamic Coalition on Schools of Internet Governance. So I'll make a few remarks and then I'm afraid I have to leave you. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be here and for the opportunity to write the preface for your incredible book. And, and I won't really talk about that because I think you'll discuss that in the session. I just want to make a few remarks about why I think this dynamic coalition is so significant and why it has been so successful. And, and I think it's really, uh, it illustrates what dynamic coalitions in the Internet Governance Forum can achieve. Firstly, I think it's diversity. It, it was set up, it was initiated by practitioners, for themselves, but in an inclusive way. So this dynamic coalition has community networks in it. It has academics in it who can do analysis and, and help document the experience. It has institutions like the Internet Society and, 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 and ABC Association for Progressive Communications that do some advocacy work and support work um, that can help generate financial um, support. And I think you need more of that. But really, it has the community networks in it. And then I think the second, for me, really critical success factor of this dynamic coalition is that, that you are using this format not just to promote the idea of community networks as a complementary. Look, you said it very articulately. It's not a competitive model. It's a model that, that complements uh, uh, um, gaps, huge gaps, and helps to fill huge gaps in the access ecosystem. But what I really admire about this dynamic coalition is that it interrogates its own practice. You, you're not just selling the idea of community networks, you're actually looking at what are the challenges? How do you deal with gender equality, for example? How do you deal with issues of inequality and power and local ownership and control in community networks. Now you're dealing with the issue of sustainability. And I think it's that critical thinking by and for the community uh, um, networks community and the presence of people like, like Luca and others. And I see Nick Bidwell as well, people who do analysis and that I think makes this such an incredibly powerful um, dynamic coalition. And I've just been, I mean, I've been the MAG chair of the IGF um, for the last two years, my term has ended. But even prior to that, uh, when I was still with, with APC, I've just watched this dynamic coalition with, with such a sense of, of um, um, appreciation and admiration, because I think it just, it, it, it's such a powerful expression of how this, this form of collective community of practice can work and have impact. So I just wish you well, and I know that your journey is continuing. And I think this book 
is tackling the issue of sustainability, which is one of the many issues that you'll continue to tackle. So um, just congratulations to all of you and don't give up, carry on. Um, be critical about those that need to be criticized and look at your own practice with, with uh, through a critical um, but creative perspective and lens as well. Back to you, Luca. Thank you very much, uh, Henriette, for these very inspiring uh, uh, remarks. It is very, it's really excellent to have you as a supporter. And I mean, as you were saying, I mean, what the great part of this coalition is it's really a community of community networks and very diverse. It's a very multi-stakeholder example of internal governance in the, purest, in the purest sense. So a lot of stakeholders coming together discussing uh, new principles, new analysis, new practices, new rules that in order to, to shape the evolution of the internet is really an example of internet governance. Uh, now, uh, I would like now to, to ask my colleague Walter if he could kindly share the video for the other keynote speaker, Natalia Vinelli, uh, Directress of Projects for Enacom. Uh, Enacom is the uh, telecom regulators of Argentina. So please, Walter, uh, if you could share Natalia's opening remark. Hello, how are you? First of all, thank you for the invitation to participate in this conference. I would like to be able to be in synchronous meeting, but today is not possible. So I'll share it through this video that will reach the organizers of the event. My name is Natalia Vinelli, and I am a deputy director of a special projects at ENACOM, which is the national entity of communication. The work we have carried out is focused on bringing internet to where the market consider it is not profitable. And therefore we understand that the state has to ensure access to connectivity to all people living in our country. In this particular case of the work we do from the sub-direction, the focus is on the rural communities and native peoples and the peoples who live in the popular neighborhoods of our country, which amount to more than 4 million people. It seems important to me to emphasize that both the sub-direction and the policies emanating from the national communications entity are built in an articulation and dialogue with the social movements and the networks that bring together the sector. In this context, and after the great work of dialogue with the community networks, we built a specific tool for these networks, which is the Roberto Arias Connectivity Program, which is a financing model in the promotion of community networks in rural areas and communities of native people. This is the first time that the national entity of communication develops a specific tool for the community. Until now, there was no tool that could contemplate the needs of this sector, which we are releasing a tool that aims to develop the connectivity infrastructure in these areas and that also give a bonus for the wholesale internet service for six months. The interconnection with the community network and also puts special emphasis on training in the development of a suitable model and the maintenance of the network by its own users. By community network, we understand networks that are self-managed by their own community until the moment when we took over the public management. There were two networks operating with license in our country, Argentina. This number was growing in the last year. Between 12 and 14 community licenses were approved and we opened this specific line hoping to collaborate and work and guarantee the access to connectivity for all the people who live in our land. The program is named after Roberto Arias precisely in recognition of the importance of the community sector. 
Roberto Arias was a popular communicator, very involved in the defense of nature, creator of an intercultural neighborhood in the south of our country. This is an interesting fact because the community networks that we see that are presenting themselves to the NACOM programs are often associated with previous work related to communication with community televisions and community radios. That is to say, this sector has been advancing and growing and has managed to professionalize itself and it still has many conquests to achieve. It is also growing in terms of management and advancing towards processes that allow them to work with connectivity for their communities. The Roberto Arias program is mainly aimed at networks, so commercial providers cannot participate in this call and specifically prioritizes native communities which are registered by the national government and communities linked to family farming. We understand that this is related to the management guidelines established by the national entity of communication at the beginning of the new administration from 2020. These management guidelines place the reduction of the digital gap at the center, we understand that this sector is the most neglected and had to be the first to be able to reach everyone. Well, this is what I wanted to share with you and above all to emphasize the importance of the dialogue between the state and the popular organizations. Because where there is dialogue in joint work, wonderful things come out. As surely now, in other dissertations of this meeting, we are all going to hear and know. Thank you, Walter, for playing this video. Unfortunately, Natalia could not be uh, present here at this session today. Uh, but our next speaker, uh, Nicolas Shanis from Alter Mundi, um, he will speak a little bit more about the practical side of this program that Natalia just introduced uh, in the video. Uh, Nico, over to you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very glad to see our DC3 thriving and so many familiar faces here. Um, I wanted to, to share a bit uh, of, uh, from the perspective of, of the movement, of the community networks movement here in, in Argentina regarding the programs that, that Natalia just uh, presented. Um, we actually struggled for many, many years um, to have a, a program that, um, that can destine uh, universal service funds to community networks. Um, as far as we know, this, these new programs from the ENACOM are, are the first programs in the world that are destined specifically to community networks and not uh, just to small operators. The regulator here has many programs destined to different uh, kinds of operators. And these um, new programs are, are exclusively for community networks. And that is very important because one thing that happens with programs that are destined to different sectors is that um, the traditional operators um, usually tend to apply to these programs very fast because they are already uh, operating in networks uh, for many years and they have the, the skills and the knowledge 
to manage presenting programs to to presenting projects to these programs but for community networks this is a, a really difficult stuff um, step they are not used to working with the national regulator they are not used to the process to the bureaucracy and to all the difficulties that represent uh, presenting projects to such programs. And so having a program that is exclusive for community networks, we believe has been uh, very important. Uh, so community networks can take their time to study, to understand what it means to present such projects, and also to be able to comply with all the requisites that the programs present which is also a uh, new to them um, and this has administrative problems this has uh, technical issues and uh, it all needs to be addressed collectively discussed in assemblies sometimes by assemblies of native people that are discussing technology issues for the first time so it is important that the program has been design in this way. Um, we still find that although this program, when it was published, I, I tweeted, this is the first perfect program I see from our national regulator. And I still think it's a very good program. And it was the result of lots of, of activism from our movement. Um, we still find that uh, there's a barrier for, for community networks, not for established community networks, but for organizations that aim to create their first community networks in their territories. Um, you have to understand that these two programs that Natalia mentioned, uh, the, the people involved, the people that um, could apply to this program are uh, 4 million people in urban areas and 3.5 people in rural areas. So most of the communities and organizations that will be applying to these programs have never operated networks and haven't had any opportunity yet to create their own uh, infrastructures. So there is a, an important uh, barrier there that we are trying to address by bringing in um, funding from other sources that can uh, make sort of a seed funding so that the communities can have small experiences that will allow them to have them the abilities and uh, the, the mindset to uh, apply for bigger funding, which is provided by the Roberto Arias and the Barrios Populares programs. Um, these fundings are up to uh, $100,000, which for small communities is, is big funding. Um, and so they struggle to, uh, to envision what they will do and how they will develop the network. We believe that these seed fundings are important for them to have those first experiences, for them to be able them to comply with the technical, with the network mapping, with all the requirements that the, for the regulator are standard requirements that any ad accomplished operator would have no problem complying to, but organizations, social organizations and uh, territorial collectives are seen for the first time. So we still think that uh, creating uh, seed programs will be very important but the creation of the, we would say, the, this big funding opportunities is not only very, very important for the community networks here in Argentina, but also for the world. Uh, the, at the last IGF, I remember that some of us that are here today 
uh, were summoned to a meeting to talk about funding for community networks. And one of the things I said there was, uh, we need to fund every community network project. We don't need to select community network projects. We need to fund them all because all community networks are needed. Whenever there is a community network project, that project is in an area where um, there will be no other connectivity. So we need to fund them all. And I think that programs such as this that the ENACOM has created uh, aim for that because these programs are not programs that make the different community networks projects compete among themselves. They are all funded. Every project that complies to the requirements is funded. And there is already the, the agreement that the regulator will add more funding to these programs when, when the funding is depleted. So, I hope this will be a good uh, example for other for our regions and for our countries. And I hope that the book from the DC3 will also uh, be regarded as a reference in, in this matter. I don't know if yes. my time is up. Yes, it is. It is, Nico. Thank okay. you very much. And actually, uh, I will I will remind um, all speakers to have to try to stick into five or six minutes so that we have also some time for debate. And thank you very much, Nico, for this, because it really reminds us that uh, two important things here. The first one is that really ENACOM, I mean, I, we really have to praise the kind of effort they have been doing because really they have been uh, hearing, listening from communities and really try to do the best possible to uh, facilitate life to community networks. Uh, so this is really something that should be uh, praised and considered as a real a best practice. But uh, there is always room for improvement, and especially it's always difficult to facilitate life of wannabe community networks or community networks, both in terms of funding, but also in terms of capacity building, and also in terms of reducing any kind of other problems they may, might have, technical problems, access to resources. And here is where I, really, I would really like to, to give the floor now to uh, Marwan Fayed, uh, who is... Uh, I think probably the first speaker from uh, the, a, a purely private company we have uh, at DC3 uh, in over the past years, because it's, it's, it's really difficult to have speakers from private sector that are interested in engaging with community networks. And I would really, really like to thank Marwan for his availability. Uh, I know they have been doing some excellent work at Cloudflare uh, with community networks and with communities that build community networks in mind. So please, Marwan, the floor is yours. Wow. Um, thank you, Luca. Uh, I'm, I'm both honored and humbled to be here. Uh, um, I hope it's OK that I share a few slides. I'll try and run through them very quickly. Can we just ask the, the, the technical support to give Marwan co-host privilege? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, as Luca said, I mean, uh, one is this is fabulous. All the things that I'm hearing, it's good to see some familiar faces. A couple of people might have uh, be hearing this idea not for the first time. And I apologize for that. But hopefully there's just a different enough spin on it to make it um, still interesting. So uh, it's true. I'm from Cloudflare. Um, I'm also a co founder and director at a community network in the UK and Scotland called hubs CIC and a former professor at the University of St. Andrews, just to give some context. And I, and I wanna be clear, I think it, it may be obvious in this room, but my name is one of so very many. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be here speaking uh, if, it, if it wasn't for their efforts. So um, I wanna talk about, about the perspective of, of, of a content service or delivery network. And uh, for people in the room who are unfamiliar with these ideas, these are sort of the large networks that empower the internet and the transfer of data without ever being seen or known. Um, these include Cloudflare, certainly, uh, Akamai, um, Fastly, uh, Amazon to some extent, but we could also start to rope in some of the large end providers, things like you know the Microsofts and so on, and the IBMs of the world that have large private networks of their own. Um, in the interest of transparency and positioning, as I said, uh, I'm going to talk on the heels of having helped launch a program at Cloudflare called Project Pangea. 
And really what this is about is providing free internet services for community networks. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about why this is important in a moment, but also within the community network organization that um, we have up in Scotland, uh, if, if, if only for credibility, uh, we, on the heels of being encouraged by uh, Guifi, we decided to apply for the sustainability award um, and were actually winners beating out many of the large incumbents in 2016. So uh, I'm pointing out the obvious here, uh, which is that community networks can and do need to um, deploy their own local infrastructure, um, and they can do that just fine. Uh, once they have their own local infrastructure, of course, there needs to be connectivity to the internet connection point, and most often this is not local. I'm going to stop here and point out that both of these are largely within the um, communities control. By no means am I suggesting that these are easy, but many of the problems are certainly surmountable with the right supports. Uh, and <clears throat> again, mostly governed by the communities and the stakeholders. The last thing, however, that they need to do is to purchase these onward internet services. So this is where they get routes to and from the open and public internet. Most often this is bundled with backhaul, the idea of carrying data from one place to another, not actually routing, uh, but that's not an actual requirement. So if I go over these, if I look up here in the upper left, um, this is the co-location model. Very few community networks happen to be so fortunate, but if you are, tends to be more urban located and you tend to be very close to where the internet connection point is and you just put in a router or a box, connect directly. This second model here is, is the most dominant model that, that at least I'm aware of, which is you have a community network in one place on the left and the internet connection point on the right, and then you have some third party that connects the two. Very often the third party, as I said earlier, is the backhaul provider, is the internet service provider as well. But there's this third model that has started to emerge. Nico's network, Altermundi is a great example, Guifi is an example, and, and our own hubs does this as well, where you have a bunch of community networks, community-oriented networks, and the communities themselves are stakeholders in the backhaul network that carries data from the wherever these networks happen to be to the internet connection point and provides that service. It's a really advantageous model because the communities are not only stakeholders in their own infrastructure, but in that infrastructure that carries the whole. And so they can decide how to reinvest um, when there is revenue to do so. So coming back to this long list of, of things that are reasonably familiar, I think, to many who are involved in the space, I'm going to point out that the first two, again, well within control, but this third one on the backhaul the, and the internet connectivity itself, the pricing is oftentimes uh, locks people out. And that is, that is assuming that the service is available at all. And this is the problem that uh, I wanna talk a little bit about today. So I'm going to point out here something um, that is maybe obvious once it's stated, these content delivery and service networks or these private networks, they are not actually internet service providers, but they are incredibly well-connected networks. And when I say well-connected, of course, that's relative to the region of coverage. So the global network will have uh, many more connection points, of course, than, than regional ones. But for their size and coverage, they tend to be very well-connected. So then the question is, what might these types of networks do to contribute to the community models and why, crucially, why would they want to do so? Uh, and this is, a, I think, falls into the self-interrogation space. So I'm going to stop and say the content delivery and service networks are, are in many ways already set up to do this. So internally, they have all of the equipment and infrastructure and probably have additional services to offer community networks. Um, externally, they participate in the open network directly. So they have all of the know-how. Um, uh, uh, to do this. Um, and of course, as I said, irrespective of size, uh, the size of the network tends to um, uh, determine the, 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 the uh, provision of service, which is most often appropriate. So I'm going to claim here why. This is the why these networks would do this. And I claim the incentives actually better align with, with CDNs than they do with the traditional and conventional carriers. And I wanna point out a couple of things here. First, let's deal with the additional cost of taking on community network traffic. If you're a large CDN, you're unlikely to feel the additional traffic that is generated by these community networks. 
Um, if I think in the Cloudflare case, this is terabytes and terabits and terabits per day. So a few extra gigabits here and there isn't going to hurt anybody. And if you're a small CDN, you probably would incur some additional cost for carrying the CN traffic, but I'm going to point out the more you need to do, the cheaper it gets. So um, by taking on the CN traffic, you can actually negotiate better rates overall and share them. And perhaps most importantly, I'm going to point out that the CDN customers are not actually the end users and the clients with their browsers and the computers. The customers of these networks are the people who have the content themselves. Um, and it could be anything from um, genuine content providers to government services. Okay. Uh, and if there are more connections into the network, then there are happier customers because there's um, more people to buy services. Uh, there, it's easier to fill out forms um, and the list goes on and on and on. So you could actually not only increase the audience for the customer, but reduce the customer costs directly because they don't have to provide as much support for um, offline services. Okay. And as far as charging models go, I'm going to claim there's no reason for this to be any more than cost coming back to these, this first bullet up at the top. I can say that this works because Cloudflare's own Pangea project, which launched earlier this year, has uh, received um, far more attention and interest than we anticipated, than Cloudflare anticipated, and we're still playing catch up. Um, it's been launched for Cloudflare, which is a large network as part of the corporate social responsibility program. I'm not suggesting that this is easy for these types of networks. There, there are always things to consider. So uh, these networks are typically set up for downstream, just sort of mostly one-way traffic, but the community network would add the upstream. And there might be issues of isolating. How do you isolate the, the, the companies or the, the network's traffic from the community? So these things exist, but they're not insurmountable. Um, so quick summary, something we all know, this onward internet service cost can actually impede sustainability no matter the models that are in place in advance. CDNs are well connected, the incentives are there, and there's no reason to charge more than cost. But I want to finish here with one question. I only wish that we could find an answer today, um, but it's that if the community network model extends both to the local infrastructure and the backhaul to the internet connection point, then maybe possibly the community and co cooperative models could also apply to the CDNs themselves. And the reason I say this is important is I'll give you a very simple example. This is at least a few years ago, there was a large measurement study that found that most of the interest in traffic for content in Africa, just taking Africa as an example, people in Africa who wanted content that was in Africa, their connections actually had to leave Africa before they could get data. And you could imagine if there was a content delivery network focused on Africa, not only would you then reduce um, the cost and pre increase the performance, but then you also might be able to establish some new connection points for these, connection, for these communities to connect to. And with that, I think I went over slightly. I'm really sorry, Luca. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mara. That was a, very, <laughs> was a very interesting uh, presentation. Like, as Luca said, we don't often really get contributions from you know, um, the private sector. Um, but since we are a little bit behind on time, let me uh, quickly introduce the next speaker, who is, uh, well, Mike Jensen, probably doesn't need much introduction, he's the community networks veteran, let's say, and Mike will be um, unpacking the LockNet team's contribution to the uh, DC3 outcome. Mike, please. Thanks very much, Senka. Um, I guess I want to start off by congratulating uh, Nico Chanez's work and Altamundi's in uh, this uh, sterling achievement of getting uh, a new uh, really flagship initiative going where we actually are seeing uh, state support for uh, uh, community networks and I, I'm really hopeful that uh, that experience will be emulated elsewhere because um, generally this is our, our key problem is that uh, to connect uh, unconnected areas or to connect the people in unconnected areas uh, governments uh, around the world usually just subsidize the large commercial operators uh, to reach the rural and remote areas uh, who then have to make quite large investments in the infrastructure that uh, often don't provide sufficient revenue to cover the maintenance costs, which are high in these remote areas, or they have to impose high user fees to cover these costs, which then makes the service unaffordable for the majority of those people living in these low-income areas. Um, so 
just just to dwell on some of the other alternatives that we've been looking at uh, because uh, this idea of uh, universal service funding uh, is really a very uh, new one and uh, we haven't had many uh, uh, other examples of this anywhere really uh, so the uh, association for progressive communications locknet program has been supporting a variety of different community networks around the world uh, who have different funding approaches uh, that we hope will demonstrate some of the alternatives to this uh, traditional uh, strategy of funding the big commercial operators and hopefully some of the lessons that we've learned will be uh, useful to others others uh, most of this is documented in the uh, chapter of, on sustainable funding models uh, that's just been published but i just wanted to highlight a couple of the key observations uh, uh, that we make uh, as an introduction to the potential uh, discussion of the range of funding sources that uh, community networks generally consider uh, in trying to uh, get uh, startup funding and operating funding too. Uh, I think that one of the key conclusions is that uh, there's a limited potential for commercial funding, uh, mainly due to three factors. One is that um, there's quite a high perceived level of risk uh, in um, making these kind of inv commercial investments, which uh, you know uh, are really required, uh, uh, they have deep risk assessment strategies in terms of, of whether they're going to actually recoup their investment or not. And some of this uh, p high level of perceived risk is is fairly genuine. Obviously, uh, there's often a lack of experience with uh, rural communities uh, who um, and the rural context. They they're unfamiliar with that. And at the same time, uh, you know, the experience of these rural communities in managing a complex technical service like connectivity provision is low. Uh, so there may well generally be um, higher risk in making these kinds of investments. Uh, perhaps an even bigger factor is that uh, community networks are often extremely small relative to these large commercial players. You know, they may only be serving a few dozens or hundreds of uh, users. And so, of course, um, they're less attractive to traditional sources of commercial finance or even uh, development assistance uh, because the overhead for administering these kinds of projects are just the same as for much uh, bigger projects. So uh, to disperse a very small amount of funds out of a large investment fund or a large development program uh, is very costly to do uh, on an individual basis with these very small networks. Uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, as important as that is that the fact that the, most of these community networks um, offer low surplus revenue. So unlike the traditional communication, telecommunication oper operators uh, who price their services for the uh, wealthier markets and um, expect to make a significant profit, often you know, having to get a return on investment uh, in the course of three or five years maximum. Um, while many of the, the community-based network projects don't actually aim to make any profit at all by, because they're trying to ensure that the uh, costs that they recover from the users are as low as possible so that the service is as affordable as possible in these low-income areas. So these, um, these three factors really argue against any real potential for the kind of traditional commercial funding in most cases. Uh, now, these observations have led us to better understand the key role of what we call MISO organizations. Uh, so these are basically national or regional organizations that support multiple CNs. So you can imagine that this can potentially increase the scale of these initiatives to the extent that one might be able to attract some form of uh, soft funding, for example, that would be uh, inappropriate or un unachievable for very small organizations. So these uh, MISO organizations typically um, support uh, the management of the backhaul link to the, on behalf of their CN members, negotiating with the commercial operators, for example. Um, and they're also um, operating national schools for community networks in many cases to build the skills needed uh, to manage these networks sustainably, and also to build awareness of the role uh, of these networks in addressing connectivity issues so that they're able to um, do more effective regulatory change, which is often what's needed to make them more effective and, and able to recover the costs of the network from their end users, 
and also to be able to solicit state funding or, or other sources of funding. So if, uh, some examples of these MISO organizations are in fact Altamundi in, in Argentina. Uh, another partner we work with extensively is uh, TIC AC in, in Mexico, which uh, operates or supports about uh, 20 small community networks. Uh, they're actually the holder of the uh, mobile license that these networks operate under. Uh, and they do a lot of technical support for them individually. Similarly, we have uh, a network in South Africa called Zenzeleni that we're working with. Um, they actually are a nonprofit corporation, which then supports, or which is currently supporting two uh, cooperatives also with the same name, Zenzeleni, in, in two different areas and, and helping these two networks obtain the necessary capacity. And then an example in Asia that I'll end with is uh, Common Room. Uh, which is again uh, working with a number of different uh, small scale providers and, and small scale networks and, and even community radio stations uh, to help them uh, gain the capacity that they need uh, to be uh, sustainable. I'll leave it at there so we can have maximum time for questions. Thanks very much. Sandra. Thank you very much, Mike. We are actually trying to get your questions in the chat to have them at the end because as there are many speakers, we are running a little bit, uh, well, not out of time, but we still have four, good 40 minutes, but it would be maybe better to have all speakers uh, presenting before and then having a, a final Q&A at the end. So please, everyone who has questions, put them in the chat. We already have uh, some, a couple of address to Nico and a couple to Marwan. Uh, we will try to have them all in the debate at the end. And also I would like to offer an apology because I will have to leave at 11, uh, well, at uh, the end of the hour sharp because I have another session starting. So without further ado, I, we have just heard uh, well, many wonderful examples and practical uh, details from one of the community networks veteran. And there is another one that uh, it's always mentioned as uh, one of the most knowledgeable person in community networks, which is, uh, who is Jane Coffin. Uh, who is another uh, really well-known community network veteran, not only a good friend, and uh, she is here with us today. Uh, Jane, uh, you have been supporting uh, all community networks around the world for years, and please, Jane, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone, and um, just to clarify, uh, thank you, Luca. I am speaking as Jane today. I'm in between uh, jobs. Um, some of you knew me when I was at ISOC. You still know me, of course. But I'm moving on to a new opportunity soon um, with Connect Humanity. And it's right up this alley that I'm going to connect, connect Humanity, which is a fund that will be um, hoping to finance uh, projects like these <laughs> um, with loans or grants. And so this topic is one that um, when I was working at the Internet Society, and I know the team there, fabulous team, we'll still be working on is the innovative financing, financing models for sustainability. Um, it's been really great to hear what everyone um, all of the good uh, inputs from everyone today. And while you were speaking, I was thinking about the importance of interrogating our own practices, thanks to Henriette's great comment. And I wanna bring up a point that a, a friend, Yochai Ben Avi has uh, made. He's the new CEO of Connect Humanity. And I'm not just putting in a pitch for that organization, but a pitch for something he said on a call I was on recently about abandoned markets or the perception that markets are abandoned. Obviously, there are markets in rural and remote areas. They are different than the traditional markets, so we need a different type of approach. And I would point the people who are either in the room in Katowice or on this call to page 58 of the book, Luca, <laughs> that you and Senka have edited and put out. Um, you'll see Steve Song, who's on this call as well, his jar of rocks. He's got the three jars of rocks. This is something that Steve has used in many presentations, and I love this. Um, the visual itself, because if you look on page 58 and you see the jars of rocks, you um, will see three jars. You'll have big rocks, big rocks and medium-sized rocks, big rocks, medium-sized rocks, and small rocks. And Steve will often say, to channel him a little bit, that this can symbolize the number of networks that can be available in a market. It could also symbolize the numbers and different types of regulations and policies you can have and the different types of funding models you can have in a community or in a country um, or in a region. Because if we take the old traditional route, we're buying into lock-in from old traditional financial models. 
And I'm a firm believer, and Mike mentioned this earlier, um, there are some big donors out there, the billions and millions, right? But we have seen the change that a small amount of funding can do. This was grant-based and it's moved into more grant-based funding, but I believe a soon will be um, repayable when the model there in Georgia develops. But if you've got Ucha Suturi, who many of you know, started out with a $40,000 grant from the Internet Society for some of the network development in Georgia, which led to USAID, the World Bank, um, the Czech Development Agency and others putting in funding as they saw the importance of rejuvenating rural areas, bringing connectivity to rural areas for many different reasons that we all know. But the issue is there, there are markets, there are different markets. It, it might be something where we're looking at voucher-based systems, or it might be that you do need that startup funding, as Mike pointed out, to get you going and change those funding mechanisms. I'm a serious believer in the fact that we can come at this from a different perspective. And it's not lost or abandoned markets, but they're different markets. And Mike, when you said um, that private funding is some of, they're very risk averse and they have a risk assessment model. They're, they're not sure how they can recoup investments. Um, and there is lack of experience in rural communities with some of those models. And perhaps we need to start looking at the rural communities to redevelop models um, for financing and take a, a, take a different look at what investment means and human capital. And this is some of the impact investment that's going on as well around the planet. Um, with these rural communities, remote, rural and urban underserved, they're different markets. If we hear from traditional operators that they can't serve communities of 5,000 and under because they can't get their return on investment, but we know they're amortizing equipment, we know their accounting practices dictate A, B, C, D, E, well, then those models are broken for the rural areas. Those models don't work. So we have to reinvigorate and create new models, just as we've done with community networks. So if all those rocks can fit in the jar together, then we can come up with new funding models to fit in the sort of different funding jars. Steve, I don't know what you put in there if you don't have rocks, but I could see that we could add in, um, and many of you know me, I'm willing to hack anything, which probably gets me into trouble <laughs> most of the time. Um, but look, there's a way for us to do this and to aggregate donors, whether it's loan-based loan or if it's grant-based. And I think that's what many of us do together as partners. We have worked in partnership together to create funding opportunities and or training opportunities and that is part of that impact investment, I would say, from the donor community and from the, whether it's the Internet Society, A4AI, APC, it's a development bank. You're relying on the humans on the ground to input their human knowledge, and there's value there. And so what is it that we're trying to tap when we're looking at new risk assessment? Are the people leaving that community? No. Are they staying there? Yes. Have they been unconnected? Yes. Do they want connectivity? Yes. So they're stable. There's no risk of flight they're going to be there. And if there's investment in that region, then that investment is not just sunk costs, right? As some people will say, but there's recoverable costs there because some in some communities there can be, whether it's putting the human effort back into building out the network um, free, if you will, not really free, free, but we have the labor paid for in that sense. Um, if you look in the high mountains of Georgia or in Sarantaporo, I saw Vasilis here, um, People have donated their time and capital. So there's something there on the return on investment that isn't broken. So I would posit that we need to shake things up a little bit. Of course, some of the traditional donors um, are going to look at us like we're crazy. But we've all seen what microfinance can do. We've seen what collective action can do. And I'm really excited to think about the ways that we can publicize. And thank you, Luca and Senka again, and everybody who contributed to the book. Um, those getting that story, those stories out there are super critical. I said this on a panel yesterday for, um, I'm not sure if it was the NRI panel or another uh, community network panel that we have to get the case studies out there. People will not believe us that there is a potential for lack of risk or the potential to work with a private company. Like if Marwan's company can come in and say, look, we're willing to work with you. This is how Hawaii Telecom has gone into Waimanalo, one of the Hawaiian islands where there's an indigenous community. Hawaii Tel took a chance on the community because they knew the network was built that they could interconnect with at the submarine cable landing station. Hawaii Tel is providing free backhaul for about a year, I think. I'm not sure what the plan will be going forward, but that community does have a revenue stream from some naturally grown products, which they're going to work out a deal with Hawaii Tel. 
So Hawaii Tail doesn't seem to be interested in eating that community network and trying to encompass it in their own network. They want to interconnect with it. So that goes to Nico's point of, and, and yours, Luca, of self-determination, self-empowerment, but working with providers to cut deals. And so I think we can shake things up a little bit. Universal service will be my last pitch. Let us change universal service for funding mechanisms for community networks. We can't keep the old lock-in because that old model of funding supports the old telco model. I'll stop now, Luca, thanks. Thank you very much, Jane. This really was really inspiring. And uh, we all know that we have been, we had an excellent relationship with you in your previous, with your previous hat at the Internet Society. And we are very sure we will have an excellent relationship with you with your new hat as soon as you will start with connecting the mighty which is indeed a very interesting new initiative that is worth uh, checking uh, now i would like to give the floor uh, to uh, my friend senka that is has not only been uh, co-editing the work with me uh, but also uh, uh, drafting a very interesting chapter together with uh, david johnson and uh, their colleague uh, about community networks uh, how they meet community currencies. So this is a very interesting marriage that we have started to also to explore a little bit some and to discuss some years ago, but really needs a very in, a, a further focus uh, to be very well understood, even for the potential it can have. Uh, after Senka's presentation, I will sadly have to leave because I have another session starting in 10 minutes. So I at 55, I will have to, need to leave, but I will leave you in the very good hands of Senka that uh, is not only going to present now, but also uh, finalizing the, 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 the session of today. Thank you very much, Senka, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Luca. Can everybody see my slides? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I, I will be unpacking our contribution to the, uh, to the DC3 report that I co-authored with my colleagues, David Johnson, who will be speaking next just after me and uh, Will Ruddick from our partner organization, uh, Grassroots Economics. And before I start, I would just like to highlight that for this project, we received support from the um, Internet Society Foundation as independent researchers. And just to give you some um, background on what motivated us to, to, um, to start this research, um, I, I mean, um, as much as we would like to uh, make access to the internet entirely free, it is simply not sustainable in the long term because there will always be some um, running costs and one has to pay for, for the backhaul and there is maintenance and other operational costs. So we basically need to uh, mindfully design our, our packages and pricing so that people are still able to afford it. And uh, yet, even for a nonprofit, uh, whether it's an ISP or cooperative or community network, uh, some expenses will always need to be covered. And the other issue is the, the funding landscape, uh, which is often focused on the potential of scale. And yeah, this is even somewhat contradictory when, you know, when talking about community level innovation. Um, anyway, we are trying to address both of these issues with the concept of community inclusion currencies. And um, our partner organization, Grassroots Economics, has implemented community currency programs in 45 locations across Kenya. And they have shown that they contribute to long-term economic development and strengthen the communities and make them more resilient. Uh, the fact that in certain communities there is simply not enough cash flow uh, does not necessarily mean that there is no income generating activity going on. And in fact, community currencies are always backed by, by some of those activities within the community, being it um, farming or food production or certain services and so on. And um, in this project, we are exploring the potential of community inclusion currencies to, to provide rewards, monetary rewards, to users who help expand community networks. And um, this expansion can be done in several ways, for example, by installing or hosting or maintaining infrastructure or by generating local content. Um, how this token-based reward mechanism is embedded in the in the mesh protocol and how we can monetize bandwidth. Uh, that's something that uh, David will explain in, in more detail in the in the next presentation. And um, we are engaging with uh, two communities. Um, one of them is Ocean View, a low income area in the outskirts of Cape Town in South Africa. And we've been engaging with this community uh, since 2017. And 
there the network is pretty much all set up up and running and it is a combination of a, of a um, mesh network providing internet access and the ineti platform uh, providing uh, access to local content and services free of charge um, so what we're mostly um, busy with these days uh, halfway through the project is, is seeding the idea of a community inclusion currency and once that concept is more widely adopted, people will be able to pay for internet access using these currencies and also earn rewards when, uh, for example, when hosting uh, equipment on their premises. And we also believe that this effort will help um, increase the sense of local ownership, which is um, also essential for community networks. Um, and on the other hand, uh, at our pilot site in Kenya, well, there the situation is, is quite different because Grassroots Economics, our partner organization, has already been very successfully implementing uh, community inclusion currencies for, um, for over a decade. So people use them on a, on a daily basis, I would say. And uh, from the initial field work we performed earlier this year, uh, people seem to be very interested in, in, in local content and the local Ineti platform. They would like to host tools, um, like for example, a repository of all locations where they can uh, trade Sarafu, which is a local community currency. Uh, so in this sense, the, the, the network that we, uh, we are building there would strengthen the already existing uh, ongoing community initiatives around uh, financial inclusion. And um, when it comes to financing and, and investment, so if we tokenize bandwidth, then we can also tokenize the, the future production of, of that bandwidth. And then several small ISPs or community networks would uh, create tokens that are redeemable for their bandwidth. And these can be part of liquidity pools that connect them to a common network token, which is then connected to a national currency. And then impact investors who are uh, eventually interested in supporting a portfolio consisting of, of multiple ISPs or multiple community networks, they can do so by investing in the common network token. So if a, if a funder really wants to focus on, on scale, uh, this could be a way to invest in, in, in multiple community networks um, at, one, at once, while the networks themselves still maintain the, the, the very local context. Uh, so in, in that sense, that this tokenization of bandwidth could address both the issue of um, financial sustainability of the networks, how to, you know, how to make them uh, survive financially beyond the initial rounds where backhaul and everything is sponsored, as well as the issue of the uh, scale focused funding agendas. Uh, and yeah, I just wanted to add that we have dedicated a section on the INET website to um, small uh, blog posts and updates on this particular project. So um, yeah, please do take a look and reach out for any further information. Uh, okay, I see that Luca has left us. So then I guess I will be introducing David, the next speaker. Yeah. <laughs> who will, will pretty much about the same project, but maybe <laughs> from a slightly different perspective. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Sanka, for the intro. Um, the slides okay? Can you see them? I'm going to just full screen it. All good. All right. Fantastic. Let me just move this out of the way. So um, thanks a lot, uh, Luca, who's just left, and Sanka for the uh, opportunity to just share my journey with you. So today I'll be talking about uh, empowering digital participation and affordable access through the NETI platform, but there's going to be a specific focus on community inclusion uh, tokens. And um, so before I begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, the Ocean View community, Black Equations, Ovicom Dynamic Cooperative. Really, without them, none of what I'm talking about would have been possible. And thanks again to um, our community currency expert partners in Kenya, Grassroots Economics, and of course, our funders, uh, Internet Society Foundation. Um, so really the core principle of Aneti is working with communities uh, to co-design content and services and principles uh, that are relevant to the community through workshops. So what you'll see here, for example, in this picture is where we began our journey with a set of workshops to understand what the community needs uh, in late 2017. 
And uh, one of the key messages we actually heard in this workshop when listening to the community was a need for a community currency. So I just want to play this video of Khanif sharing his dream for the community. A small community like this, um, about 90% of the, the small economy of Ocean View is in the hands of people that's living outside of Ocean View. So whatever money is spent within or on these businesses um, immediately leaves the community. And also, when community leaders uh, are being asked or talks about economic development is being held, um, they normally think that getting big corporations in is a solution for the problem. But then again, mm -hmm. it's just the money leaving the community and all the other small businesses closing down as well. So, um, what we've been thinking of is to have the money circulating within the how do we get to do that? And one of the options is to have a small currency or a local currency that only has a value here. And once that currency is being used and supported by the community, um, these bigger businesses, it doesn't matter who comes in, they will then also have to buy in um, to that currency. Great. So what you would have what you would have picked up there um, is oops is really that um, you know, there's this problem of 90% of the money leaving the community and going to the outside businesses and this need for a community currency to build a local economy. Um, okay, now I've just got to work out how this works. Yeah, so um, so quick background to Aneti. So really the Aneti system allows the community on network to run a low cost voucher-based internet service and provide free localized services and access to local content. And the free localized services provide a lot of analogs to services you would find on the internet, like file storage, video streaming, and chat, and so on. And uh, the cooperative has rolled out um, a number of hotspots across the community. So you'll see these indicated by the blue circles. Uh, at the moment, they're well, back a few um, months ago, there were about 10 connected via mesh backhaul, and uh, the NETI services and voucher-based internet are available from, from many of these hotspots. In terms of sustainability at the moment for the network, deploying a NETI, so income for the WISP or community network is from internet vouchers. Typically, these are about 10 times cheaper than cellular networks. And the NETI provides a voucher services and network monitoring tool, set of tools. Uh, and we're now developing this community inclusion token that can be used to uh, pay for the services. Uh, and this is being fund by, funded by the Internet Society Foundation. So our, our original dream was actually to incentivize expansion of the mesh by creating this blockchain-based mesh where anybody can own a router and buy and sell bandwidth autonomously. And then users are rewarded in a cryptocurrency for Traffic, traffic passing through their router. Um, and uh, yeah, you, would, you would sort of, in this picture, the, the red um, circles are where users have added uh, sort of their own routers where they're rewarded uh, in cryptocurrency. And we thought maybe we could cover the whole community with this concept. We needed 250 Wi-Fi hotspots to cover the community. Uh, and the technology to make this happen was, is actually developed by Althea which is an open source project that uh, integrates mesh routing with blockchain-based reward for traffic that passes through your router. They use a stable version of the code at the moment that's based on XDAI, uh, which is a public permissionless blockchain based on proof of authority. Uh, and this is what we've learned so far in our journey. The problem one, most community members can't afford to buy a $150 uh, router. Second problem is that for this cryptocurrency, XDAI on ramp via Ethereum is very expensive. To send $10 to an XDAI wallet can cost between $10 and $20. The other problem is uh, payments between the routers are creeping up. Um, this is XDAI to XDAI. So two years ago, transactions between routers were 0.000021 cents, took five seconds. And now transactions cost approximately uh, one cent. They've gone up. Sort of three orders of magnitude and take 15 seconds. And you've got this conundrum where if you build a side chain to speed up transactions and lower fees, 
as it grows in popularity and people get greedy, fees go up and transaction times get up. So this is sort of idea two in our journey, working with grassroots economics is to create a community inclusion token. Uh, they use uh, something called Bloxburg proof of authority blockchain. And they have a group of people offering services and products in the community. Uh, and this is in Kenya and we will do something similar uh, that accept this token. So in this picture, you could say in green, there's a community member that buys tokens uh, with bulk discounts from a community network. Uh, and this is akin to buying airtime from an operator. Uh, the community member could then redeem some of these tokens for data at any point. Uh, usually there'll be incentive, incentive for a larger number of tokens getting better gigabytes per token value. And these tokens can then be redeemed at other vendors that are part of the system um, that uh, join the, the community inclusion token, such as a food garden or a math tutor. And you can even have something like recycle collection points that pay uh, people in tokens for bringing, for example, glass or plastic. Um, so how this would also uh, work with the network is the network organization can pay router hosts uh, who put routers on their roofs in a community inclusion token or directly via data vouchers. And the community members could also pay to advertise, for example, for file storage uh, as well uh, in community inclusion tokens. And using a national currency could also be used, but this would be disincentivized by using some friction. For example, you could say there's a 5% lower payout for router owners uh, if they use a national currency to encourage use of the local currency. Um, so I'll stop there and thanks very much uh, for listening. So this is a work in progress and really evolving as we learn. Um, and please do visit the website where we've got a blog uh, about our journey. So I'll end there and um, thanks, Senka. Thank you, David. There are also some questions, uh, discussions in the chat related to blockchain. So please feel free to enter the, the discussion. I'm afraid we won't have much time for Q&A. Um, so our next speaker is Sarbani Belur. Sarbani is uh, a research scientist at the Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai and also the Asia Regional Coordinator for um, APC for the uh, community networks connecting the unconnected project. So please, Sarbani, uh, go ahead thank with you. Uh, do you have slides? No. Uh, no, I don't have. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senka. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to speak about the work that we do, and uh, DC3 gives us a platform to do so. And I'm very happy to uh, speak about this uh, work of ours. So the work uh, that we uh, wrote up in the in the DC3 report is uh, on uh, um, on trying to understand that how can community networks be funded in the last mile, and uh, one of the ways by which uh, the community networks can be funded is through uh, is through the Gram Panchayat Development Plan inclusion of internet for development in the Gram Panchayat Development Plan. So what is Gram Panchayat? Gram Panchayat is the village council office that is there in India. All over India, we have 250,000 uh, village council offices in India. And, um, and what happens is that uh, the optical, the government of India initiative, that is the Bharatnet optical fiber, terminates at, the, at these uh, village council offices. Now, um, it, is, it is very difficult um, because BharatNet does not have a sustainable business model yet. So um, the one that, was, uh, the, that, we, that we had actually asked for was 100 Mbps of bandwidth to be uh, available at the village council office. It's, it has now become only 2 Mbps of bandwidth. That is, that is also at a subsidized rate. It is, so when the subsidy is removed, that means uh, it is going to be expensive to pay. So we wrote up this article on uh, the include for the call for inclusion for internet for development in the uh, Gram development plan. And why is this not happening in the in um, uh, in this in the village development plans in India is a matter of concern because um, because. Anyways, the optical fiber is not reaching 
the village council offices. And in the locations where it has reached, there is still only two Mbps of bandwidth, and it is not sufficient for the village council office to carry out the work. Now, uh, this is based on the 4P model, that is the uh, private public child partnership model that has been this has been worked on by um, by me and my team members uh, since 2017 18 when we connected uh, the villages um, in remote maharashtra and uh, there is a need for the village council officers to come into this partnership model because uh, they are the ones who have the finance available finance both from the government as well as from the state government. The national government gives them some money as well as the state governments give them some money. So the money is not being utilized and that is a matter of concern, which can be utilized through this inclusion of internet for development in the Gram Panchayat. So, uh, so we are not yet reaching out to the USOF and uh, and the and the and the other internet service providers in the in the villages. At least a way of enabling uh, enabling connectivity to come to the uh, village council office so that it can then get uh, distributed in the villages uh, or the hamlets where connectivity can never come otherwise. So um, backhaul is a challenge and uh, backhaul can be available through this uh, internet for development being included in the Grand Panchayat development plan is what we have written in our, um, uh, in our article. And the other thing that I would like to mention is that um, it, the figures in the, in the table, uh, in, the, in the article is based on the, on the real deployment um, scenario. So we have deployed and we see that this is the cost that is coming, that will come out of it, that the, what will be the capex and what will be the opex. And only in the first year, it is going to be expensive, but from the, from the next years, so each development plan is valid for five years. So the first year is going to be expensive, but for the next three or four years, it's going to be only the operational costs that the village council office has to bear, which is a minuscule amount of money, not a lot of money. So this is, uh, this is uh, the plan. And uh, hopefully, I am taking it forward uh, through various agencies in India now and trying to uh, bring this into the, uh, to, be, uh, to be included in the village development plan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sarbani. Um, and our next speaker is Nick Bidwell. Uh, Nick has also been working on community networks for over a decade, I believe. And um, she will sh share a, a, a case study that is also in the, in the book. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Nick, you are muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So hopefully you can see my slide. Yes. Right. Um, okay. So uh, congratulations on another valuable book in it, a great panel. And it's lovely to see everyone. So as Senka said for, oh, I, how do I, don't know how to move the slides forward. The, it's, I shouldn't have updated, should I? There we go. Right, so just over 10 years ago, I was visiting a village deep in the um, Southeast Asian forest and the academic and activist who was host hosting me said that linking economic enterprise to the connectivity that had been installed had distracted from the original reason for getting connected, which was about defending the forest from logging. Now, that was around the time that I started my journey with rural CNs, being involved in starting three in Africa and undertaking research on others in Africa, Asia and Latin America. And throughout that, I've repeatedly seen the difficulties in reconciling funding models with environmental sustainability. So today I'm going to be um, my usual provocative self and, um, and, and ask, what do sustainable funding models encourage CNs to sustain? And can we imagine a future 
for funding that will help CNs to keep the world alive. All the CNs that I've been to are in places that are affected by extraction. Nearby there are mines, water is diverted for hydroelectricity, villages produce charcoal, food and tourist experiences for remote market, markets. And the strategies to fund and promote the CNs tend to assume that extraction. They tend to assume that market logics are inevitable. Proposed projects, whatever funding model they're um, funded by, are assessed in relation to financial returns or risks, even for small projects. CNs are modelled on businesses and they're promoted based on how they contribute to growth in industry and commerce. And these assumptions shape the ways that the technologies and the technological work in CNs are used, are valued, located and scaled. Now, all the CNs I've encountered are also in places which sustain their local commons. Communities manage land for dwelling, gardening, grazing and access to water. And they prevent agricultural monopolies. And they share skills to recycle and repair. But the CN's value chains and business models often exclude the very activities that keep these commons alive. For instance, um, often they use technologies like Wi-Fi that are in places that can't be accessed in the forest and the gardens or moving between kitchens and water. So while the work to create and maintain a CN comprises many different activities, including preparing food, including childcare, it's certain types of technological labor that is valued and monetized. So we can say that in fact, many funding models bind CNs in a story that contributes to climate crisis. Take for instance, how a bigger the better quantitative logic is used in assessing the impact and sustainability of CNs. The efficiency of scale inherently neglects how the ways of knowing, being and doing that sustain life are as hyperlocal as the CNs themselves. Life is sustained within specific relations between humans and other living and non-living beings in particular places. But this bigger than better logic is part of a situation where the ICT sector currently constitutes global emissions that are similar to the aviation industry. And if trends continue within the next eight years, the emissions of telecommunications companies alone will equal the aviation industry. But I'm optimistic. So let's think carefully about what sustainable funding actually sustains. And let's imagine funding and technology models that would help prioritize the relations that sustain the network of life for the planet. Some recent grant initiatives for CN, such as the APC, illustrate how fund disbursement can prioritise plurality and proliferation, not scale, by accounting for CNs with diverse goals, operations and difficult to measure impacts. And more widely, we can keep our eyes on the growing investment in the rural global south as part of achieving net zero emissions. For instance, there are programs that invest in regenerative agricultural po um, programs and uh, carbon sequestering in places that have the greatest impact on life and biodiversity. And let's think of the ways that technologies can help to ensure that CN support life sustaining activities and the people who do them, whether that's conservation work or reforesting or gardening or recycling. Um, I look forward to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, and I think we will have just enough time for the for the next speaker, um, Paulo José Lara from Article 19 Brazil. Please, the floor is yours. Thanks for inviting me and congratulations for the panel. I think we have a short of time, so I'll try to be quick. First of all, a little bit of advertisement. Uh, we just launched our notepads on community network, five uh, issues on you know, workshops, planning, public policies, technical aspects, and uh, regulatory aspects as well. So I'll leave my email here and then we can send it over to you, the publication we just had. 
I think there were great uh, contributions from, from everyone. And I think one of the quick things that I would like to address is that uh, every community network is different. So they have different aims in terms of their production necessity and interest, right? So uh, any model that we should be discussing should be heterogeneous, flexible, and not fixed because they um, serve for different purposes depending on what community we're talking about. And I speak from the point of view, from the standing point of uh, the Brazilian reality, knowing a little bit of the amazing work that Mexico and Argentina also do. So it's important to realize that uh, a, a model must be flexible and that might be not be functional to, to every community and every community network. Um, the most important thing that I, in my view, is that uh, any sort of funding and sustainable model must be connected to the real life of the territory. Uh, that means uh, we we spoke not much, we spoke little about uh, the the community network being able to provide support for the work and production and labor and culture that the community has already been doing uh, in their territory for years and years and years. So I think that there's two ways of thinking about it. One is the external funding that we must uh, fight for, which is public funding. We need public funding for the production of sub subjectivity, for the um, production of information. So this is one of the things that comes outside from the reality of the communities and the community network itself. And the other one is uh, internal aspects. And then in the internal aspects, we have many solutions and many suggestions here presented in the panel. And I would like just to address uh, a few more. Uh, so I think we should think in terms of provide, providing a sort of holistic, holistic sustainability, which means uh, based on the social reality of each territory. And then we have some aspects that should be addressed. One is culture, right? There's no possibility uh, of um, developing and increasing the, 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 the community without working with culture. And then this should be uh, very much uh, provided for the community network. So uh, we're talking about connectivity. We must think that the digital possibilities in terms of organizing the real life, it's not equal to access to the internet or the systems integrated webs and so on. So I think one of the most important things is to actually uh, provide those communities with tools um, and realities that make them um, make them sustainable in terms of what they already do and what they produce materially, culturally, and subjectively. I think we ran out of time. Do I have a, a couple more minutes? No, right. So I mean, just keep my emails available. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And if you want to know more about the work we're doing, um, I make myself available for, for your contact. Thank you. I'm really sorry, Paula, that yeah, no we have to cut your presentation short. Um, I just asked in the chat if you can maybe share the link to the publication you just um, presented. So, um, yeah, I see. We don't really have time for discussions and Q and A, but there's been some interesting discussions going on in the in the chat, and I believe that most questions were actually answered there. I saw that Marwan answered all the all the questions that were asked earlier, and yeah, there's a discussion on on, on blockchain going on. Um, yeah, we really need to wrap up. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, thanks all the speakers and uh, everyone in the audience as well. Uh, I think we had a really interesting and diverse speaker lineup um, and Luca is not with us, but yeah, of course, big thanks to Luca for organizing all this. He's the key person behind the uh, Dynamic Coalition. And um, yeah, also let's not forget the CTS team who worked hard behind the scenes to make this session happen. I think Walter is maybe still here with us. And um, yeah, thank you all and see you next year, DIGF. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you, bye. Thanks, bye.